Uh, well, thanks for having me, everyone. I'll uh, try to make this as exciting as possible. Uh, I know you've got an hour to, uh, to listen to me, so uh, I can understand why that sort of drags on. Uh, as I said, my name is Damien Leeds. I'm a communication designer, uh, otherwise known as a graphic designer. I've also done my fair share of web design, environmental design, and user interface design. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is I'm going to briefly go over uh, uh, how I got to get to where I am. Uh, started in 2006 by graduating a degree in graphic design, um, and then have been working full time in graphic design and web design ever since. So I'm going to spend about 10 minutes uh, going through a bit of my history and, and how I got to where I uh, got to, and then uh, I'm going to run through a project in detail, which is hopefully going to answer a number of the questions. Uh, while I'm running through this, I'm just going to hand around my folio from my first year of graphic design. I thought I might print that out just so you can get a bit of a feel for what a graphic designer does when they first come out of um, their, their degree and gets their first design job. Um, it's just a, just a handful of samples there. Um, yeah, and then we can, uh, we can go from there. So I'll start with, um, from 2006 to 2008, I worked as a graphic designer in a company called RGI, which is an agency. Uh, does anybody know the difference between an agency and um, client-side work? No? Uh, an agency is basically a company that uh, lots of companies approach to get designs done. Uh, if you do client-side, you might say you would work for the NAB Bank or the ANZ or, um, or uh, Tennis Australia, for instance, and they would have you as a what's called an in-house designer. So I started by working for an agency. Uh, that agency specialised in vehicle wraps so, and large format signage, so they would design a lot of billboards that you'd see around the, around the city. Uh, this was one of my very first designs. I was asked to, to jazz up a boat, so um, obviously just sort of came in and snuck in a few, uh, snuck in a few flames and everything with that. Um, the reason that that sort of uh, set me off on a bit of a career path was that uh, they'd originally just asked for sign writing on the boat and I uh, sort of went the extra mile and said, well, how about we do something really cool? And that's sort of what got people on board with, with my design style. And, uh, and people started coming, wanting more and more of that particular style. So from that, from that day forward, a, a jet ski company approached me and said, oh, hey, like, um, we really liked what you did with the boat. We want, we want to launch a new range of jet skis, and we want you to do the, uh, what's called the decals for those jet skis. And then a few larger companies like UD Trucks came on board and said we're releasing a new range of trucks into Australia. We want to, uh, we want your sort of swishy, cool, tribally sort of designs to, um, to to be integrated into our new uh, new truck campaign. Uh, and then following on from that, um, Daimler, Chrysler, Mercedes, Freightliner all sort of jumped on board and said that we like this design style. And uh, and essentially, I was asked um, to produce decals like this for a number of different merchandise trucks and a lot of their race teams trucks and. And this and that. So one thing sort of led to another, and um, and basically the des my particular design style of that era, which was the the tribally swishy graphics, kind of just kept growing and getting more popular, and bigger and bigger companies were were taking on board that design style and wanting to get me to come in and do those things. Um, so that was that was quite a quite a fun period. Uh, where the where the period ended, um, or towards the end of 2008, Vodafone had approached and said that they want me to, to, to do their next race car, which was essentially um, for the V8 supercars. I don't know whether you guys know too much about them, but um, so yeah, with this they were asked um, we were asked to produce the produce the design for that. Um, obviously, there was a few more design considerations in comparison to the previous ones, uh, which we had to take into account with these. Mostly was that every single company wanted to make sure that their logo was as big as possible. Uh, a company like Dexion, that little sticker there, costs them about ten thousand dollars to have placed there in sponsorship. So they want to make sure that you know, with that ten thousand dollars, that their logo is as big as possible. So, so unfortunately, with all of these logos everywhere, it made it a bit hard to do my cool swishy graphics because they uh, that were you know they would just get annoyed that it made their logo smaller. Um, so that's, that's essentially where the 2006 2000, to, to 2008 kind of wrapped up um, and my final design was for a uh, NIDOC week. Uh, I had to do a, exactly the same vehicle rack except we had to uh, incorporate indigenous graphics from the, um, I believe it was the local Wurundjeri tribe at the time. So we basically had to approach them and, uh, and ask if they could, um, yeah, and, and ask if they could produce some indigenous graphics 
and, and approve the use of those graphics on a, on a commercial base car. Uh, there, was, there was a number of cultural sensitivities which were involved in that. Um, so that's, that's essentially my, my 2006 to 2008. Uh, after having done that, um, I was well fitted enough to, to open up my own graphic design business and graphic design studio in Yarraville, which is um, yeah, also west of Melbourne. So I was able to get myself a little shop and, and set that up and um, create my own little, little design studio with, with what I knew at that point in time. Uh, the early stages of that design involved basically trying to focus on targeting small businesses. So these are a number of small businesses who I did logos for uh, in my first couple of years of having my own business. Uh, that's, that's probably the only multinational that I did a logo for it during that period, but the rest of these are usually sort of one to ten employee small business kind of operations. Uh, that was so largely centred around brand design and then from that I would produce uh, collateral such as, as websites and this and that. So that was uh, that got me through the first couple of years of graphic design. Uh, following on from that, I uh, got, started getting really interested in three-dimensional design and obviously all like sort of like video games as well. So started to target uh, environmental des design for um, games conventions and, um, and pr producing large format signage and, and three-dimensional models for, uh, for games conventions. This is for a company called Halfbrick who had a number of um, number of games which were they were releasing to the market uh, in that particular convention and, and wanted to produce some really cool displays uh, which basically fell mainly on their, their primary design which was the Fruit Ninja. Uh, so we needed to create these sort of oriental designs and then they decided to create this massive Colossotron out of, um, out of uh, sort of a polystyrene um, cast material just to, uh, yeah, basically to to explain their budget. Uh, so Halfbrick was a small Australian uh, games design company at the time, um, but we were really lucky in that position that Microsoft saw what we were able to do for, um, for Halfbrick and they approached, um, they approached my company and asked me to do the design for their Microsoft Forza Horizon um, stand, which was uh, for a convention a couple of months after that. Uh, they obviously had a much larger budget. They, they literally bought a 370Z uh, for the sake of the uh, display and obviously needed lots and lots of graphics and created all of these fake rocks and internally illuminated signage and this and that. So that was that was really kind of, um, I sort of felt that, that was the peak of my 3D environmental design sort of uh, portion of my career and I felt like I enjoyed that as much as possible so I uh, did that and then, then moved back into Brand design for much larger companies. Uh, this company, um, this company, not this one. Uh, this company basically was uh, was an Australian company which launched on the Australian Stock Exchange um, back in 2014, I think it was. Uh, they were one of the most recognised brands of the year back when back when I first created this logo for them. Uh, they became extremely big extremely quickly, and then they disappeared. And I don't really know why, but. Um, so yeah, that was really fun. So basically, uh, I went from designing logos for, for small businesses to designing logos for very large businesses and, um, and essentially everything in between. Uh, there are definitely major differences between designing logos for small businesses and designing logos for big businesses. Uh, with small businesses, generally you're speaking to a single individual uh, who owns the business and is very emotionally attached to their, to their business or their brand. Uh, when you're working with big businesses, you're working, you might have um, 30 or 40 stakeholders involved in the design who have to have a say and have um, particular stakes in particular areas of the design. Uh, do you all know what a stakeholder is? Okay, uh, a stakeholder is essentially someone who's, um, who's uh, involved in the process or who's able to have a say in what happens with a, with a design. So a stakeholder may be a manager of yours, they may be a web designer, a stakeholder could also involve the customer. So anybody that gets affected by your design or anybody that gets negatively affected if you do something wrong. So that was essentially my two, uh, 2008 to 2014. Um, following on from that, I felt like I did everything I needed to do in terms of uh, running a design agency and, and really enjoyed that process but felt it was time to move on to client-side work or in-house design. 
So I took on board a job with a company called Camp Australia uh, as their full-time on-site graphic designer. Uh, so that was basically a two-year contract that I took on uh, and it largely involved me redesigning all of their holiday clubs and, and rebranding their actual company itself. So I'll show you, I'll get pass around this one. Uh, this was a poster I did for their holiday clubs. Um, so this is what I'm passing around right here. Uh, so producing a poster design for, um, for their holiday clubs, basically the premise of this design is that I wanted uh, basically kids to actually look at this poster for a long time rather than just briefly looking at it and then disappearing. So I sort of was trying to channel a bit of a Where's Wally kind of design by making, putting hundreds and hundreds of tiny little details so that you have to look really, really closely and spot the pyramids or spot like this little kid walking or like, you know, what sort of bag he's wearing and, you know, can't see how many different animals are hidden there and, and all of these little, uh, I suppose what you call them in the movie scene is Easter eggs. Uh, so, and that, that was quite effective in its, in its design. Uh, following on from that, another design I produced for Camp Australia was their website. Uh, I'm going to go into a bit more detail about websites uh, later on. That's, that's my final piece that I'm going to talk in detail about. But essentially, the, the website design was largely centred around trying to lift their brand and make it a little bit more fun and engaging for the, for the kids and making the parents believe that it was um, worthwhile taking their kids to, uh, to, to Camp Australia and to their holiday care. Uh, after I did that, I decided to take on a role as essentially just a go-to contractor, which meant that I was, um, so from 2016 up until now, uh, I'll get called up by a large corporate company and they'll basically take me on as a contractor to, to assist with rebranding or, um, or any sort of web design rollouts or any major projects that they're undertaking. Um, so that's, that's essentially what I, did, what I do now. Uh, this was one of the early companies I did as a contractor. This company is called Message Media. Uh, they basically require a full rebrand along with a new website. So um, there was a lot involved in that. So, um, basically coming on board and, and producing scope documents and briefs and talking to all of the key stakeholders and trying to build relationships with the people who, uh, who were involved with this process so that I could find out what they need and, um, and actually produce a design for them. Uh, something else that was involved in that was uh, a project which refers to user interface design uh, or user experience design. So this is uh, Message Media specifically has an online portal that you use um, in the same way that you would say you use Compass as an online portal at school. People log into it and it provides them information. Uh, a great deal of work goes into what information we want to present uh, to um, to the people that are in the online portal and uh, trying to effectively communicate with them what they need to, uh, what we want them to get out of the portal. So they first keep coming back and then secondly um, actually uh, learn what they need to know uh, using this, this online portal. Uh, so that brings me to my, uh, to my final project which I'm going to discuss in detail. Uh, this was a project which I, uh, I only finished my contract with about two weeks ago. I launched this website specifically about four months ago, and what I've been doing since then is essentially negotiating with the with the key stakeholders um, to to run improvements in the life cycle and make sure that the transition once I actually finish this website that they can actually um, manage the website in house themselves and then they know exactly what the website's supposed to do and what they should be doing going forward with ongoing updates and, and this and that. So the end of my role essentially saw me finding a full-time web designer for this company to come in and basically take the reins so that I can step away and, and go, back to, um, go back to my study. So this is, this is essentially, these are screenshots of where we landed with the double website. Um, they're obviously full screenshots, so at any one moment you, you would be scrolling up and down the, the website here. Uh, I'm gonna throw you a few key stats with this website. Uh, although the website um, seems small when you go to it, there's actually 275 pages. Uh, the website requires the production of over 700 illustrations. Uh, the website itself contains 165,000 words and the brief which we put together for it was 12 pages which um, I, I might be able to provide you later that you can, you can review. Uh, so basically when you've got 275 web pages 
and you've got about 10 people that need to approve every single one. Um, you're talking a lot of hours of work and a huge amount of communication uh, because every single page needs to be presented to the right people and those people need to approve that web page. They need to have their opinion on that web page and then um, you need to make sure that you're addressing conflicting opinions. If you know one person wants it to be red, the other person wants it to be green, you need to get those people in a meeting and determine what's, um, what colour it's going to be in the end um, and what's going to work best for the brand. 700 illustrations in the same regard, all of those needed to be presented to certain people and each, each illustration needed to be shown to, to the entire company uh, on a whole and people would be coming back with different ideas and opinions. So of those 700 illustrations, there's a few hundred of them that might have had to go through four or five different revision processes. So we're talking thousands of, thousands of illustrations and hundreds of hours of, uh, of drawing pictures to, uh, to get to where we got to with that. 165,000 words, I'm not going to harp on too much about the, the stakeholder management, but um, when you've got lots of different opinions that you need to balance out, um, when you're doing something that's 165,000 words long, um, it starts getting very, very complicated and, and difficult, and the focus is on a huge amount of communication. So with all of these things, what we rely on entirely is a brief uh, because essentially, when one person is saying that this illustration needs to be red and the other one needs to be green, uh, or if one person is saying that we need to write a heap of amount of content for one page and not much for the other, everything falls back to this briefing document, which I'm going to run through in detail. Uh, the briefing document is essentially the document that you put together to say, um, this is what we're planning on doing and this is why. And essentially, you can always fall back on the briefing document. If someone wants something to be read, you can, you can fall back on that briefing document to say, no, this is what we agreed on, and this is the scope. Uh, so, and that obviously falls in line with um, what's called a branding document, which I'm going to briefly touch on also. That was, a, that was a side project that ran in situ with this one. So here's a bit of an example of the 700 plus illustrations that we landed on. Uh, as you can see, there's lots of different variations. So some of the illustrations were as small as a, uh, a little branded percentage icon. Some of the illustrations were quite sort of large and intricate. Um, yeah, different coloured backgrounds for different contexts. So with every single illustration, we needed to map out where it was going, why it was being produced, what it needed to be communicated, uh, how large it needed to be, what page it was going on. Uh, what were some ideas for context uh, and this and that. So an example for this, we might have been saying that we want to have a page which is um, focused around being able to search for search for certain files. So obviously we've, we've got our two little token people here in a magnifying glass which, um, which communicates the, the symbol of, uh, of searching. And the file itself needed to be a, um, we'll call it a 500 by 500 square image. Um, so that's basically the pixel size that would have looked about that big on a screen. And that determines how much detail the uh, design was allowed to go into um, based on how big it was. Obviously, if, it's, if you have a tiny little picture on the screen, the last thing you want to do is have this really, really intricate design because people aren't going to be able to see the details. So what I'm going to run through now is the stages of the design process, which I think is largely centred around what you, what you should be writing notes on. Um, apologies that that's cut off a little bit, or just let me know if there's anything that's cut off that's, um, that ruins the experience for you. Uh, so the stages of the design process involve a handful of different, um, um, different phases. Um, so I'm just going through them now. As I, was, as I was saying, the initial phase of what I needed to do when I was first contracted by this company was to provide a brief and a scope document. So the first three months of the project was going out and having meetings with all of the different um, suppliers and all the different people that worked within the company and saying, well, what do you want? Um, what are you hoping to see? What are your expectations? Uh, determining what their budget was uh, to find out um, what sort of resources I had available. Um, so yeah, uh, with the briefing, what does the client actually want? Um, do they have a problem that we're trying to fix? Um, in this instance, uh, their, their problem was that they um, that they were looking to, to lodge on the share market soon and um, they needed a brand which reflected that of a large company and as their website stood at that particular moment in time they looked like a small company 
Um, what they got shortly after this website was launched, they had a $20 million investment from a private investor. They simply wouldn't have got that if they looked like a small business. So, uh, so essentially that kind of summarised what they wanted. They wanted to look like a big company. Um, what can we do within the time frame and budget? Uh, their budget was around $200,000 to, to come in and, and redesign the website and then they had a bunch of full times on that. So overall, uh, when you take into account all the different resources and people involved, they had about $500,000 to spend and the time frame they had about six months for me to get it uh, launched and then another four months for me to, to assist with the rollout. And what can't we do? So basically when they provide you a budget like that, at the time frame like that, you need to be very open about um, what, what's not achievable within this time frame and budget. We obviously, you know, we can't get a $400,000 celebrity endorsement if we've only got a $500,000 budget. So obviously we had to, you know, not get Michael Jordan in to be the, the, uh, the face of the company. So you need to really deeply run through what, they, what you can't do. And that's very important when you're writing a brief is to, is to have a think about what's actually feasible. Uh, if you've only got a week to do something, don't plan to do something that's going to take you three or four months. So after the briefing is all locked down, um, the briefing and the scoping is locked down, everybody's agreed and the budget's been settled and, and everything's ready to go ahead, we need to roll out to the research. So the research component overlaps somewhat what does the client need, but what it does is it covers, it, um, it cross-checks what the client says they need with what they actually need. So when you're trying to determine what, um, what you should actually be doing, you don't necessarily need to specifically focus on what the client thinks they need, you need to focus on what the audience actually needs. So uh, in order to do that, you need to first determine who we're targeting. So I presume none of you can actually read this, read this audience wheel very well. No. Uh, so basically what we did in the research component is we determined that there were actually five key audiences for this company. Um, those key audiences ran from small business to enterprise, to telecommunications companies, to investors, to customers. So that's, we determined that there was five different audiences that we needed to appeal to, all within this website. Uh, so what we did then is we asked, well, what do each of those people want to hear? So enterprise, the message that we want to send to large enterprises is vastly different to the message that we want to send to investors uh, and almost contradicts itself. Uh, obviously, um, investors, you need to, uh, I presume you know a little bit about investment. Generally, investors are interested in how much money the company is going to make. Um, and enterprises and small businesses are a bit more interested in how cheaply the company sells their products. So very, very different messages. Um, and so we, we determined specifically what we wanted to hear, what we wanted each, uh, each audience to hear. And then we came and slowly figured out different ways as to how we were going to communicate those to, that, uh, to those particular audiences. So small to medium businesses, for instance, they were, we found out through research that they were quite interested in something that was going to be easy to use, easy to roll out and cheap. Whereas enterprise were a little bit more focused on something that was going to be able to comprehensively work within their, um, within their existing company structures. So different, different messages and we would then start creating content and designs to help communicate those to the different, um, to the different audience, uh, audience members. Dan, sorry, when you say we, would that have been done more with the client as well, like there at the time, or are you talking about a certain portion of it being done with them and then you had you and whoever else? Yep, so basically, Basically, as far as that research goes, is a, a research document was produced. Um, I, I produced a research document to say, essentially, based on my research, um, enterprise is definitely an audience that you're trying to communicate to. Uh, that research was, uh, was culminated by talking to the finance manager of the company, and basically he said that 48% of the income of Dubba, of, uh, of the company, is, um, is accumulated through enterprise. Uh, so from that I would say, okay, en enterprise represents almost half of your income. They are definitely an audience and, um, and then what I would do from there is I, I did a lot of research into what enterprise um, are looking for with this particular company. So how they would choose this company over another company or over a competing company and, and started to work backwards from that. 
So then a, a research document was, was created uh, following on from that. And then that re research document, in the same way I'm talking to you today, I would get everybody in the company together, all of the executives and, and senior leaders in the company, put them in a big room and sit up on the screen and tell them how I came about this research, why the research is valid, what I did to make sure that the research is, is correct and full, and, um, and what I'm planning on doing with the research. And that's their opportunity to stick their hand up and sort of go, oh, I don't think investors are an audience, a, a, a type of audience, I don't think we should be appealing to them. And then I would tell them that they're wrong and then we're, there would be some discourse and, um, and investors is, is then determined as an audience. So that's, that's essentially where the stakeholder management component comes in. I would be responsible for producing the research and then uh, I would need to get everybody in, in a room and agree that my research is valid and, um, and to, to then move, move on to the next step. So once, uh, once everybody involved was able to agree that uh, this is specifically that we know what the client wants, we know who we're targeting, we know what they want to hear and we know what, how, can, how we can appeal to each of them, once everybody's in agreement with that, it's only then, um, and uh, hundreds of hours and many, many pages of information later, that we can actually move on to design development. Uh, because until you actually get all of that research and get the brief together, there's absolutely no point doing design development because everybody has a different opinion on what they, uh, what they want, and unless you can tie that back to a particular need, you're just going to go around in circles. One person's going to say blue, one person's going to say red, so you change it from blue to red, and then one person says no green, and it'll, you'll just go through revision processes until all of the, all of the budget's been used up and you've effectively got nowhere, which is unfortunately what happens a lot. Uh, so the design developments, what we, what we got to produce in the short term, is uh, I got a designer on board to produce three, three rough uh, sketches of design, um, of design production, which reflected the, the audiences and the, what we were trying to appeal to. Uh, this is what's referred to as an editorial design. This is a flat colour, and this is a bit of a hybrid, hybrid sort of design. So we produced all of those designs, and once those designs were, um, were put in place, in addition with some wireframes, uh, we would again get all of the board members to come sit in a room and we would tell them that these are the designs that we did and the reason that we did it is because we've done all of this research and all of this brief and we think that these designs link back to the, uh, to the original scope. Um, unfortunately, one of the board members, who was a very important board member, just wanted to have his opinion anyway and we changed the design. So um, a, lot of, a lot of the research was unfortunately um, undermined but uh, but yeah, so where we, where we kind of landed is he said he had a real interest in, um, in isometric design, so he wanted us to channel this sort of isometric design. He didn't like the people as well, so he kind of wanted to re remove the people as much as possible, or at least make them really small. So there were a handful of opinions which were a bit counterintuitive to what we were trying to communicate, but, uh, but essentially we, I feel we were able to land with a design which um, which reflected the needs of the company, but also appealed to this to the particular guy who uh, was paying us um, to his sentiments. Uh, and a lot of that also came down to reflecting on what competitors are doing as well. Uh, there was a growing design trend for isometric design in the market, so that, that also reflected that somewhat. Um, so after the illustrations and the general uh, look and feel were, were created, we needed to start producing the illustrations and having a look at how they work in context of the design website. So fortunately with the isometric designs, they create a really nice flow which, which goes, into the, um, goes into the website and it uh, provides a lot of continuity. Um, so yeah, we, we were able to continue quite, uh, quite well with those designs. Um, another thing that was heavily involved in the design process was obviously determining a colour palette. Uh, with a colour palette, particularly if you're doing illustrations in your design, this needs to be your primary colour palette, but you've got about 100 colours that you need to work with. So every single one of those colours needs to be selected and cross-checked against how it fits with the other colours, whether it's harmonious, whether it's complementary, I, I won't go into detail about that. But, um, but essentially, uh, this colour palette would need to again be presented to the, um, to the key stakeholders involved, and they would all need to approve that. 
Um, when you get into this level of detail, the stakeholders kind of get a bit bored, so you sort of brush over it a bit and hopefully they just approve it. Um, secondary colour color palette, so this is obviously um, the colours. Do, do you know what a, a primary and a secondary colour palette? Uh, I suppose you probably intuitively guess what they mean. Does anybody know? No? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Not sure. Primary colour palette is the colours that appear most in the website. Secondary colour palette is just those little colours that kind of um, just appear a little bit. So if we were to go back to, say, one of these illustrations, the primary colour palette, which is your blues and sort of light blues, represents about 80% of this illustration. The secondary colour palette, so these greens and yellows and reds and oranges, kind of add little features. Um, and that's, of course, when we move to the extended colour palette, which, uh, again, every single... Uh, I even got my own colour named after me. Um, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> you would uh, you continue on to produce all of these different colours. Every single colour in every single illustration needs to be produced and checked and approved and um, before it can actually be incorporated in an illustration. So, and what you land with is, um, is, is an illustration which seems to just be full colour. Yes? So do you make the names for the colours you choose? And if so, why do you name them? Um, <laughs> essentially, um, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, essentially, you would, you would name the colours because they need to be recognised within the particular company. So each of those colours probably has a Pantone value, which would be sort of a, the Damo Green, I think, would be like a PMS167 or a HEX 63CF4F. Uh, um, those numbers are a little bit harder to remember, so you try to give them, like this is given March, you know, can you think of a particular Simpsons character who might have this colour hair? Um, so you, you try to give them names which people are going to remember, because it's important that when you're speaking with designers that they can immediately recollect uh, the names of the colours that you've chosen. Um, green, green grass, so that's, it just sort of helps with internal communications. Thank you. <laughs> But it's not necessary, specifically. It just, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a nice thing to do to, um, to make sure that people get the colours, or, um, get it through their head which colours are what. So, as I said, there were 700 illustrations, and what I, was, um, what I briefly touched on before is that every single illustration has a purpose, and every single illustration has constraints and considerations. So what we needed to do when we, uh, when we created the, the briefing to create those 700 illustrations is determine types of illustration. So, uh, which basically meant that when we were asking a designer for, to produce an illustration, we needed to be able to communicate really quickly what type of illustration that was and what that, that meant. So we created a, uh, a booklet which said types of illustrations and what do they mean. So in the particular instance, a hero illustration is a complete scene or a complete narrative that contains people interacting with a platform or other tech objects. So essentially these are examples of hero illustrations. So if we were to ask a designer to produce a hero illustration outlining a search functionality, um, they would know that they need to create this really big scene with a bunch of um, magnifying glasses and sort of something implying some sort of process. That was actually an animated illustration. Uh, so we needed to break the, out of the 700 illustrations, we needed to say, okay, we needed 50 hero illustrations, we needed 400, um, 400 spot hero illustrations, and then we needed, say, 300 symbols, and then um, 100 icons, for instance. Uh, so that was all part of the scoping. Uh, we break it up into all the different types of illustrations we're looking to do. As you can see with the spot heroes, they were generally on a white background, but in some instances on a dark background. Uh, and then of course there were spot illustrations, um, which basically were very, very simple illustrations because they appeared quite small on the website. And then there was of course iconography, so every single um, dot point or every single thing that we were trying to say, we needed to accommodate that with a little icon which would help communicate the story. Uh, so, and as you can probably see, uh, the general rule of thumb is that the smaller the illustration is, the less detail it's allowed to have. 
So this, this illustration takes up almost the entire screen on the website. So you can go into a huge amount of detail and you know, little, little tick boxes here and this and that and all of these little extra details. Uh, as the illustrations get smaller, as you can see, the amount of detail is reduced. Uh, this only appears as a sort of a, about that size of square on the website. So you have to cut down the amount of detail. Obviously, uh, these, these appear quite small, so there's very little detail. And then there's almost no detail in these. So uh, taking into account the contexts of the design. Uh, so the last thing I'll talk about with regards to this, um, with regards to the production of the website was uh, how I was involved and, oh yeah, you can, sort of, you can sort of read the stuff on that side. Uh, so how I was involved and who I needed to talk to and who else was involved in the project, uh, either in assisting me or, uh, or being someone that I needed to report to. So essentially it was the marketing manager for this company that brought me on, that asked me if I could, if I could assist with this rollout. Uh, this is me in the middle. Uh, so he was the person that brought me on. The director um, was the person that was paying my wage, so he was the person that actually approved the budget and made sure that I was getting paid. So he was the person who's, um, he, uh, in, in this particular instance, was the one that wanted the isometric drawings. And as I said, even though I didn't think it was a particularly great idea, um, he was the one that was paying me, so I had to do some isometric drawings. Uh, the product manager, essentially, those people are responsible for um, actually rolling out the products and they're, they're responsible for building the product that this company sells. So every single thing that was done needed to be bounced past this product manager to make sure that it was actually, um, that the, the, what we were producing on the website was um, in line with what the actual product offers and what the differences are in, in the market itself. Digital marketing manager, does anyone know what SEO or AdWords or Facebook marketing is or does? Uh, basically, uh, all of those things are trying to get people on, into the website. So a digital marketing manager is responsible for throwing out Facebook ads or doing Google AdWords, so little sponsored links on Google. Uh, they, they're responsible for doing SEO so that your, your website appears really high in the Google rankings. So everything that we did and every decision that we made needed to be bounced past this person. If there wasn't enough content on one page, he would step in and say we need more content because it's not going to rank well on Google. So a lot of content decisions and design decisions had to be uh, passed through him. Uh, he was also responsible for making sure the contact us button was as big as it possibly could be on every single page because uh, his responsibility was to get people to contact the company. So we needed to, he was always trying to push to get the, get the what's called the call to action button larger and larger. Uh, oh, that's him again there. Double oh, up. There was two of them. Uh, copywriters, uh, copywriters produce content. So, of 165,000 words needed to actually be written by someone. Uh, so, what we did is we provided the copywriters the, the brief and went into detail as to what every single page was intending on doing, what the audience was, who we were trying to appeal to, and what we were trying to say on every single one of the 275 pages and then the copywriters have to go off and actually write 165,000 words. The graphic designer who I was working with in producing the illustrations, uh, she needs to be briefed in on exactly what we were trying to communicate and what the design style was, and then there was lots of back and forth between myself, her, and the director in determining the colour schemes, the design direction, what was planning on, the, how many illustrations there was going to be, and what we were going to be able to communicate in each of those illustrations. And then I was also involved in the development, so which is the coding of the website. So with every single design decision that gets made, a developer needs to be involved to say, well, is this actually, uh, can this actually be done on a website? Uh, obviously, you, you can't have a hand pop out of your computer and slap someone in the face, so you need to try to do that using, uh, using the tools available. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of the scope was uh, around creating, uh, determining who will do what part. So I would bring every single person into a room and we would talk through exactly what each person's responsibilities are within this project and what we, what's expected of them and what the time frames are. How will they report? Uh, there, that's very different. So we would, obviously the, the graphic designer sometimes would talk directly to the director, but I would always try to be in the middle so that the, dir the director can't, can't um, cut me out of the equation and, and start pulling the design apart. Uh, so, 
essentially we needed to determine who, what, uh, what channels each design and each idea needed to go through before it was considered approved and before we could proceed. So a lot of conversations were around, uh, perhaps with the graphic designer, I might say, look, you need to send us a daily email with what you've achieved and what you're expecting to achieve by the end of the week. Uh, with the marketing manager, I would be sending him a daily email outlining key problems which we might have been facing for that day and, uh, and some key milestones which may have been achieved. Uh, and then um, how do we ensure quality? So basically, how do we make sure that we can test and, and make sure that things were, um, have been done properly? 165,000 words, you're going to get type, uh, type errors. Uh, even using the right there, there and there, that doesn't necessarily give you that red squiggly line because you, you haven't spelt it wrong. Uh, it might give you a little squiggly green line, but, um, but we needed to read through every single one of those pages individually, several people, and make sure that they were absolutely uh, faultless. And what are linchpins? Uh, linchpins are essentially um, uh, problems uh, or, or key areas that, um, that the whole process is going to break down in. So a linchpin was, for instance, uh, we couldn't proceed developing a website until we had the, the director approve the design style. Because if we had to try to keep going with development before the director approved the design style, then um, we might have had to roll back everything and then start again because he didn't like it. So, so they're, the, they're the linchpins that you need to say, no, this particular thing definitely needs to happen before we do anything else because the last thing I want to do is have to bring it all back and start again because we, we've overlooked uh, what's called a linchpin. So that represents the, the end of the, uh, the process that I went through. Um, as you can see, it's quite a complex process. One of the key factors is communication, being able to effectively tell each person what's going on and, and make sure that each person is happy at every single milestone. Um, when there's lots of people involved, you need to constantly keep your finger on the pulse and make sure that um, everybody knows what's happening as well. Um, and yeah, and try to, uh, a, a, lot of, um, a lot of predictions as well, trying to figure out what's, uh, what certain people are gonna do at certain times so that you can anticipate problems before they happen. Uh, and then, of course, being able to problem solve on the fly and change the direction of the project or, or if, a, if, a, if a major linchpin is affected, say the, the director did decide that he didn't like the design anymore, uh, you need to be able to on the fly reassess and try to determine how that's going to affect the timeline uh, or whether that's going to make a uh, delay the project or uh, make the project go over budget. So that's, that's essentially my story with, uh, with that. Uh, did anybody have any queries or questions? I'll go see that stuff we were talking about. So, now that that's done and dusted, does that company solely own all of that intellectual property and stuff? Or do you still maintain some kind of... Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, no, I, I relinquish any yeah. control that's over... part of like, the contract and Over that. Um, yeah, following on those lines, like if there was anything that was specifically um, uh, what I would say patented or trademarked, any approaches that I used or any design styles which were unique to me, I would need to approach that company and say, look, this is something that you, I can't hand over intellectual copyright to. So if the particular design style, if I sort of, um, if I wanted to make sure that they would always go through me to, to produce the illustrations, I would say, look, I'm not prepared to allow you to produce similar illustrations. Um, and they would in turn simply not hire me because that's, that's too restrictive. But, uh, but yeah, that, that, would be, uh, that would be an instance where I would step forward and say, um, I'm maintaining copyright over this and we need to create some sort of contract to say that I'll continue to do the remainder of the work, but uh, I can't hand over um, specific rights to a certain illustration or design style. Um, as part of the project. Mm -hmm. And can you go back to just thinking about that indigenous art that you use? How did you clear up the cultural issues of that? Um, I got this. Uh, got asked that question in my last presentation. This was because it, it was about ten years ago. I can barely uh -huh. remember. But essentially, the um, indigenous design is a very, very sensitive topic, uh, particularly in Australia, as you, as you may know. So one of the one of the primary ways.
ways that you would address any potential issues with regards to Indigenous artwork is to ensure that it's not an appropriation, it's, it's actually the authentic artwork of the people that need to, need to be approving it and, uh, and that, those, um, that the elders in the community are, have actually approved the, the design of this. So appropriation, of course, would be me going ahead, being a non-Indigenous individual and producing artwork that looks similar to, to Aboriginal artwork. Uh, and then putting it on the car, uh, that would be seen as appropriation. Um, because we actually got the Indigenous people within that region to produce the artwork, uh, it's not considered appropriation, it's authentic artwork. So the question that needed to be asked was more about are they happy with the artwork that they've produced to be uh, replicated onto, onto a vehicle in this manner. So what we needed to do is um, in the end, of course, they were perfectly happy with it. Um, they were, they were, of course, paid to produce the artwork. So ethically, we we adhere to any um, obligations or, or ethical considerations with regards to that. Um, and once they gave us this artwork, we would then uh, send them the the schematics of the car and how we were intending on using that artwork, and they would need to approve that. I, I believe their approval essentially was just in writing. They have to sign the bottom of it to say that we're, we're happy for you to use our artwork in this manner. Yeah, that's wonderful. Can you just clarify the Dada company? Yes. What were they about? <laughs> so it's like you yeah. quite get a handle on that. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really go into too much detail about that. Uh, so Dada is a cool recording company uh, that was founded, I think, about five years ago. Uh, it's recently gone onto the Australian stock market. So basically, it's, it has cloud call recording, which essentially means that um, yeah, now small businesses and any, any enterprise is allowed to record mobile phone conversations. So essentially these guys have produced the software which is going to allow for that uh, ahead of the curb, ahead of some of the lifting legislation around what you can and can't do in call recording and what you can use it for. And in being ahead of the curve, they've signed up the likes of Telstra, Optus, They've gone overseas and signed up with all of the major American providers, so that now they've they've essentially cornered the market. In that, uh, very very soon, once call recording becomes more prevalent, the only people that you can get to record your calls will be this company. So that's that's sort of how they've presented, and that's why they've entered the stock market because they're going to turn into a billion dollar company very very quickly, uh, because people have no choice but to use them. Uh, a few other features that they've used with their call recording is that when you um, when you answer the phone, for instance, it will record the call and it will also transcribe that call and provide sentiment analysis, which means that if you've got a uh, a, a call centre of say 500 people um, who deal with complaints, you would be able to it would actually listen into every single phone call and transcribe it, and it would determine whether the com whether the customer was generally happy. Generally angry, generally scared, or generally anxious. Uh, so we'll be able to determine what their emotions were when they called. So a, a company with 500, um, a, a call centre of 500 people might get say 50,000 calls a month, and you would be able to say of that 50,000 calls, uh, the general consensus was that they were 5% angry, 3% happy, and 2% scared. And what you'd be able to do is you would then be able to say, okay, what sort of training can we do to make them only 2% angry um, and, and say 10% happy so that you get all of this data back so that you've got these metrics. Uh, does, does that answer your question? Yeah, so is it like the call centre base and it's then there to analyse the uh, success of that or uh, so generally? It's, it's the software that actually does the, does the recording. Um, it stores the recording, it transcribes the recording, and then it provides... So, sort of the process of that. Essentially. And then it, it provides the report back to the company that's done the recording um, to report back on, on what was successful and, and, and start giving some high-level data on so all of that sort of stuff. This is probably a little bit about that, but you given arguments about privacy that are around all the time, does that influence your decision to work with someone like that? It's a good point. Um, well, there are pretty strict, particularly in Europe, the uh, GDPR, there are pretty strict regulations on what you can and can't do in terms of call recording. Obviously notifying people that they're having their, their call monitored, uh, this and that. So 
I think any ethical concerns, particularly in this um, uh, in this realm, uh, with regards to phone call recording, because it's been around for about 30 or 40 years, have kind of been addressed in legislation. Uh, so with regards to ethical considerations, with regards to invasion of privacy, it's less of a concern with call recording. Um, but the, I have worked with companies before that uh, invade privacies in ways like cyber privacy invasion. Uh, there was a company that would do those little um, little competitions that you'd find like on Facebook that you know you you have to do this survey to win a something toaster or something, and then they would they would just harvest your information and, and sell it on. Uh, I refused to work for a company like that. It's probably about ten years ago when they were when they were looking to do that because essentially they were really just stealing people's information and, and shelling it off. And the issue with that is that the legislation hadn't caught up with the technology. So because the technology they were using was very advanced, um, they hadn't actually had the time to write laws around what you can and can't do uh, around that. Obviously with, uh, with Cambridge, I think, um, yeah, the, the laws have since tightened around what you can do with people's information and how how well you can basically what what you can whether you can steal people's information and what you need to do before you take people's information is a lot more tightened. So a company like the company that approached me ten years ago probably wouldn't exist in today's environment. Um, but that said, Facebook is still absolutely terrible at stealing people's information. So it's, you know there's a lot of legal stuff that still needs to happen probably over the next ten years to to make sure that people aren't getting their information stolen, um, or that they at least know that they are getting it taken. Uh, yeah, does, does that answer the question? Yeah. Are you able to just click up the actual website? Is it live or it's not live? Yeah. Yeah. So that guys can have a look. Yeah. 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 Y
does, if, does everybody understand what wireframes are or what they do? Yeah, no, layout, layout's exactly the right answer. So basically this says, this, this is what the design's going to look like um, without the illustrations, but this is where each key piece of information goes. Uh, so the, the wireframes in this particular instance that on this particular page were largely designed and centred around making sure that we were addressing our key audiences. So we've got our primary audience, which we determined to be small to medium businesses, uh, it got the largest um, largest spot in the, in the hierarchy of the uh, positioning, and then our secondary and tertiary audiences, business and enterprise and service providers, were given our secondary and tertiary spots. Uh, and then following on from there, we were looking to to then uh, make make our information um, provide information around the product features, which is universal to all of the audiences. Use cases about frequently asked questions, further reading. Uh, so, um, and again, this is an example of a wireframe of what's called a mega menu, which is a big menu that drops down. Um, how this mega menu was going to be able to determine what the audience type was and then shuffle that particular audience into the, into the different areas as they need to be. So this, this is an example of, I think, the first set of 32 wireframes. Um, so yeah, this was an example of the, the pricing and the structures how things were going to come into place, and every single one of the 275 pages needed to be mapped out in this in this manner. So what we were going to do with every single one of the pages, and how we were going to approach each one. Um, yeah, so that's that was the wireframes that needed to be signed off. Um, what main software and stuff do you work in these days? Uh, so that's. Uh, this was mainly done in Illustrator, although there's a program called Sketch and then there's another program called um, uh, Adobe XD, uh, which is specifically designed. So these, these wireframes are referred to as user interface design. Um, so Adobe XD and Sketch are user interface design software. Uh, is user interface, in, user, face, in, user interface design. Uh, software, whereas Illustrator is more just general design software. Uh, but because I've been using Illustrator for 20 odd years, I, I generally just do it in Illustrator anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there anything you could explain about the wireframes? Yeah. 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 Yeah.